turn this on. How's that? Good. All right, like I said before, we're going to hollow today with this guy here. This is the Monroe hollower. All right. And I'm going to pass this around while I show you how to sharpen this little cutter in here. And what you'll notice, it has this little round cutter in here. All right. There's a bevel on the bottom of the cutter. I don't know if I'm under the video right now or not. Yep, you are. All right. And on top here, there's this guard, or depth gauge, he calls it, or guard. What I'm going to tell you today is I'm going to ride on this as my bevel on the top here on this guard. I'm going to come up, and I'm going to come up into the pieces and rotate up into the piece. So I'm going to be using the guard up here as the, as the bevel that I'm riding, all right? This bevel on the bottom here, I won't be using this today, and I'll be talking about this a little bit more. Because if I use that, I have to rotate down into the piece. And as soon as I wrote that down into the cut, as soon as I get to the point at which it's going to cut, it's going to go boom right into the piece and take off like a banshee, all right? So that's one of the things we'll be learning today. Another thing is, you'll notice when I pass this around a second here, that I have this almost closed all the way, all right? So don't open it up too much will be one tip. And the next tip is you're going to notice that it looks like it's clogged whenever I take it out of the piece. And we'll learn that it's not really clogged. You just shove it in there harder and take off the cut. Right. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to sharpen this cutter. The one that I have in here is a carbide cutter. All right. I'm going to be sharpening the high speed steel cutter. So what you do is you take this carbide cutter out of here and you stick it into this mandrel here. And since I have two of them, I'll pass this one around for a while. So you can get a look at what that head looks like on there. All right. Now, this thing on here this thing spins, all right? And it drives me crazy if I try to sharpen it the way the directions say. What the directions say is that you should take this, take it over here to grinder, and hold it up on the grinder like this while the grinder is turned on, right? And this will spin around, and the grinder will spin around, and before you know it, you'll just have a mess in your hand here because, you know, if you get this at the, not exactly at a perfect right angle, it'll just grind the tip right off in no time because, you know, we're only using the little edge on here, all right? And you'll just make a mess out of it. Well, then he sells more. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so the way I do it is I hone it. And the first thing I want is I don't want this thing to spin because I'm going to put it in here. So I just take some tape and I wrap it around in here. Oh, the handouts today, someone told me they didn't get a handout. There's more of them on the web under my website. And the other thing is, is the handout that I had for last week isn't as good as the one I had for today. But I was expecting a lot less people last week. So I didn't throw all those away. So there's like 10 or 15 of the old ones from last week that don't have the stuff in there about how to sharpen this cutter. So you might want to go to the web and get one anyway. All right. The newer ones are on the glossy paper and they have this in there. But that glossy paper is kind of lousy. It smudges. Anyway, so here's my drill thing, right? I'm going to put this in here, and since I'm putting it in here, I'm not, I could put a draw rod in here and play all the games. All I've done is I made sure that the jaws here are all the way back, and I'm going to set it. All right, so it's going to stay there now. Now I'm going to tighten it up in here, all right? And I could go find my wrench and tighten it, but I don't really need to, because all I'm going to do is hone it. And I really like this method because I can see exactly what's going on. So what I'm going to do is take my diamond home here. Now I know the camera doesn't catch this very well because I adjusted the camera for what I'm going to do in a little while here. But I'm just going to hold this up under here and I'm going to hold the back edge against the back edge of the cutter, right? Because I don't care what happens on this back edge over here. I'm going to cut with the front edge over here, right? So I'm going to hold the back edge on here and when I'm just going to rotate up into it. And when it gets to the right spot, I'll feel it and I'll just hone it off, all right? So now I can just hone this in here. So this is the way I sharpen this cutter, all right? And you can run this about 1,000 RPM. And one of the advantages to this is you can sharpen the carbide one, too. Although I haven't, I've played around with it a little bit. Supposedly you can't sharpen the carbide ones, but since this is diamond, you know, you can't sharpen the carbide on a wheel because the wheel is too soft, you know? You should be able to hone the 
All right. The one I'm using tonight is owned and it's not quite as good as it used to be, but it's better than nothing. Anybody know if you can sharpen carbide with the CBN wheels? No. no you cannot? I don't think so. No. I'm going to tell you not to. Excuse me? I always have the vacuum attachment over here, so I never use the vacuum. I never use the vacuum bar. But... <laughs> I actually find it's easier just to take that thing and twist it a little bit. All right. The next thing I'm going to do is mount my piece onto here. I like my logs to be really, really wet. And this log just happened to be cut in November, which was nice. You may have noticed when I brought it in here, I had it all wrapped up in plastic. And that's because I had it at home and I made sure it was nice and round and I made it look pretty so that we could not be here all night while I roughed it out. <coughs> Zach makes it a challenge over here because he doesn't have the hand wheel on that side for me. And I'm going to turn in reverse today. And I'm going to do something I normally don't do, but it makes people happy. I'm going to tighten up the set screw in here. So that when we have it in reverse, it can't possibly come off of there, hopefully. I don't see this as a big deal myself. I never tighten them at home, but they almost never come off. <laughs> but I have to say, in my defense on that matter, is that I usually use my VD36 lathe at home, and I didn't talk about this, but this has the VersaChuck on here, head, and my lathe at home has, the Versa, has, a, has a head that looks like this. It does not have a thread on head. All right. So that's why I put them on, and it doesn't make any difference if it's forward or reverse. This has the VersaChuck plate, and it's in the handouts, I think or the newer handout that's probably in there. I really recommend this VersaChuck system. If this is a big piece, I'm not going to take it off because I don't want to be spending the whole night here. All I need to do is just put this head on here, screw it on, put it on there semi-permanently. You know? And then just take these three bolts, loosen them up, a little twist of the bolts, bang, it comes right out. Another twist of the bolts, bang, it goes back on. You know, I didn't mean to, I forgot to bring another plate with me. I have another one of these I was going to show, but I forgot to bring it. But, all right. So, how are we doing with that head? Is it almost around? Halfway. Halfway, huh? So, I'll make this round, and hopefully it'll be done. I'll talk about this in a second. Like I said, I'm going to cut on the outside of this with the cutter today, and that's what actually Raleigh Monroe does when he does a demo. I did a demo a couple years up ago of a totally turning, and I actually share the room with Raleigh Monroe. I always like to wear my face shield, even for a demo, but this one has this wire on here. Some people look at this and say, oh, that's a fabulous idea. It's not a fabulous idea. It's a lousy idea. One thing when you've got to look through that mesh, it looks like fix all these little lines. The other thing is, is that this would probably prevent the gouge from knocking my teeth out, but it's probably going to still cut through this. If the gouge comes banging off of here and hits this face shield, There'll be some resistance there, and it won't do a whole lot of damage, but it'll probably do a lot more damage than if I had a plastic one on there, all right? So I really prefer the plastic ones. Lost where that thing went. How's that? How's that? Good. That's good, huh? All right. And I gotta find what I do with the tool rest. Oh, there it is. <coughs> you know, if I put the, the, the tail stock up, the way I look at safety is, how long does it take me to go to the hospital? You know, if it takes me like, you know, 30 seconds to put this tail stock up here, it's going to take me a hell of a lot more than 30 seconds to go to the emergency room. Last time I sat there for four hours before they even looked at me, you know. So, I'll put this in forward. I always like to run this in after the lathe's already running so it finds its own spot. Alright? And I'm just going to make this round and then we'll put the, the other cutter on.
I could cut all of this with the Raleigh Monroe cutter, but it's a lot easier if I start out with it already round. I don't know if I just told you or where I forgot. I told you when Raleigh did his demo, he did exactly the same thing. He did his cut all on the outside. He started from a raw log and cut everything with a Raleigh Monroe cutter. All right. It's really nice to have this lathe where it's the right height for normal people. <laughs> for you newer people, the lathe we had over Brookfield, the only person that was the right height for it was for Buster and a few other people that were really tall. This is a face plate, so I have the screws in there. <coughs> this little spot I put down here represents where the screws are. All right? So, I'm going to talk about this other guy because I realized I have to fool around with it quite a bit if I want to set it up on this lathe. And I wasn't going to use it very much at least now, but I'm just going to talk about it. I'm not going to use it. go quite slow enough. It's off by about an eighth of an inch. This is the uh, Trent Bosch's stabilizer. One of the issues you get into with these bars is the longer you, the further you hold these off the rest, the more and more stress you put on yourself because you're trying to hold this piece and it's way off the rest here and it's going up and down like this and it's bouncing all over the place. So people have come up with all kinds of systems to eliminate some of that. And this is Trent Bosch's system, which I saw Trent use. And I really like this particular system, his elbow tool. And I'm not going to set it all up. I tightened everything up tonight. But what this does is, by having this on here, I can move this in and out any place I want. And that's just what is, this is what I really like about Trent's system, is that I can move this any place. So, if I was going inside the piece, I could just take this and slide it right on in and it rides across this nice big wide rest here, right? And now I can, he takes care of all the up and down business for me, or most of it, all right? He takes all the stress off of me. The other thing I really like about Trent's system is that, I'll tell you in a minute here, is I always trail the tool down and then I come into my cut and I can pull this back up into the cut, all right? And a lot of the systems, once you get this fixed, this is fixed. You know, so when you go to make that first cut at the beginning, it always has to be at the maximum cut and it takes off like a banjo, you know. On this one, I can just keep my hand on here. I can rotate this down a little bit, come in, start to cut, and rotate this up and then tighten this up with my hand and I'm ready to go. All right. So, and the other thing I really like about this system is that I can take this out of here and it goes way over there and I can come in here and I can look in there and say, oh, you know, it's not as deep as I thought it was. You know, and it goes completely out of my way, you know. <coughs> and that's, that, this was a bonus that I didn't know I was going to get until after I tried it. And you can run this arm either way. You can run it like this, back and forth. Or you can take this arm and shove it around this way and run it like this. All right. And sometimes it works better like this when you're working in this area up in here. Other times it works better here. When I take this off of here, you'll notice that... Uh, my arms sink down, it's not a lightweight, it's a lot of steel. And these bearings in here are really big and heavy. And they're the heaviest ones that I've seen. I've gone to the various shows and looked through the different ones. The other thing about this one is it is really, really smooth. I mean, it is so incredibly smooth in here, you know. And I was doing those birdhouses on there where I had it over the maximum amount over the rest. And without this, I would have not, never been able to do those birdhouses. All right? But like I said, this needs to cut right dead on center. Otherwise, the run metal cutter will not cut very well at all. You can see here that I'm about, well, I'm a good deal above center right here now. I can actually pull around with this a little bit and get it to go down a little bit further. But it's still above center, so I'm not going to do any examples for you. I'm about a quarter inch above center. And it has to do with 
to this little thing hitting right here. So, I don't think this is any problem at all on the one-way 2436 because I have one of those at home. <laughs> you know? But, and this is the three-quarter inch model, which just means that the, this shaft in here is three-quarters of an inch. I have a five-eighth inch shaft in here right now, and this is the little adapter in here. All right? And the only thing I could say that I don't like about this too much is this the little adapter is aluminum. And that's why you can see it rides up and down a little bit on me. I kind of stretch this thing a little bit. So I'm going to go take this and make this into a three-quarter inch bar. You know. But if I had to do it again, I would buy this on a three-quarter inch bar. The Monroe comes on either a five-eighths bar or a three-quarter inch bar. All right? So, is there any questions about this? Otherwise, I'm going to stick it out of the way. How much is it? Oh, that's the thing. It's $350. Well, some of you are going to say it's really expensive. It's a fabulous deal for the amount of steel you get in it. And the bearings, it is really nice. There are other systems. There's the harder roller bar system, and there's all the back bar systems that are used by uh, Lyle Jameson style. I don't like those Jameson bar things because they're always locked in back here, and you got to move your hands in here and fool around, and you get the laser up on there, and it's... To me, it just doesn't feel like turning it on. I like it with my gouge back here, and I like to unlock my leg up and move with my body, you know, while I'm using my gouge to make my shape, all right? And with that guy, I can do that just like a gouge, because it does all the movements that I normally do. It doesn't lock me into there, all right? This is my laser. I'm going to put it on here. I'm going to talk about it in a little while, but I'm not going to use it right away, but I'm going to stick it on. So that I don't have to stop later and stick it on. Excuse me, is, it, is there any way to move the camera so you can see the inside of the board rather than... Uh... We're not going to do the inside, we're going to do the outside. Oh, only the outside? And I'm going to tell this gentleman here in a second to flip to the other camera and we'll be right on the spot, I think. Try the other camera. Oh yeah, gotta be right there. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. No, no problem. You've got to, if you have a problem with that, you should ask about it. I'll be happy to change it. So I'm gonna set this so that I'm cutting right on center. Normally at home I have a little collar on here, so I always know that I'm on center. I'm just gonna guess tonight. So we can see now, the laser ain't going to do there, it's going to move it around. We can see there that if I had the tool rest where I just put it, I'm too close, right? Because I need this not to be, I need this not to be interfering on the tool rest. I don't want it riding way back here, right? I want it out past the tool rest. So I need to move the tool rest out. So I put the tool rest in the right place for my gouge, but not the right place for this. All right. I'm going to put this down over here. Actually, I'm going to stick this in my pocket and I'll still lose it. Now, in my handout, you'll notice there's a few tips at the beginning. One of my big tips is do not run the lathe too fast. If you run the lathe too fast, things just happen, bad things happen really, really bad. But the cutter cuts very nicely at about 500 RPM. All right, and I'm just going to guess that this is 500 RPM. I can see I don't have the best light on here, but I think it's going to be all right. You can see here, I put it in. So like I said before, is I usually come in here like this, and I can ride here on the upper one without it cutting. If I bring it up a little bit, it'll cut a little bit more. I can go either way. All right, and you can see right now, it's cutting better in this left to right motion than it is in the right to left. And that has a lot to do with the way I have it set. Right now I have this, this guard on here actually, this depth gauge or guard, it moves around a little bit. And I have it set right now not to be pretty, pretty tight on, the, on this side, which would be my right hand side, and it's pretty open on the left hand side, so I've shoved it over just a little bit. And that's why you can see right now it's cutting more when I go to the left. And when I go inside of a piece, I'll always be with the lathe in reverse. So 
So I always use the left to right motion as my roughing motion. I use my left, right to left is, 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 the, is the roughing. When I go that way, it's roughing. And when I go this way, it's finished cut, all right? So we can see that again. I'll start low and I'll come in here. And I'll go across. You can see it's cutting quite nicely now. I am going uphill with the pump again, cut to it. But when I go back this way, cutting rougher. That's the more the cutter is exposed. And I just did that on purpose. notice that the shavings that are coming out of here are these nice long shavings just like you would get right off the gouge. All right? Oops, I'll hold it over here under the camera. Now the ones you get like right off of the gouge, it's not like this really fine little sawdust. If you had one of those little Ellsworth style cutters in there, you would get this fine little sawdust. All right? The fact that you're getting these shavings is another reason why I'm going to encourage you to make your holes on your pieces pretty large if you're making hollow forms, right? Because if you try to get these large shavings out of a little hole, it's a heck of a lot of work, right? So, at least practice by using those. All right? I want to go a little bit faster. I, I have this adjusted, I think, the way Raleigh Monroe adjusts, suggests you adjust it. try to cut this bowl here, it has this hard lip underneath of here, right, I can see it on the camera now, whoops, let's see here, here it is, we can reach right up underneath of here with the, with the Raleigh Monroe tool and cut this lip out, so I'm going to cut this section in here eventually with the lip, with the Molly Raleigh Monroe, all right, if we try to go in there with our gouge, we're going to have a lot of trouble, because when you go in here with a gouge, <coughs> First off, it would be almost impossible to reach up underneath of there. But if you do try to reach up under there and you manage to do it, you have to come around here and pull this around so quickly, it's almost impossible to pull the gouges around fast enough to make these undercut lips. All right? So I'll go back to the Raleigh Monroe in a minute. First, we'll work on the outside of this bowl and finish it up. There's my surface and grain. Can you see that on the camera? <coughs> Anybody notice anything? Did I go the right way or the wrong way? I went the wrong way, right? I've learned that when the wood is wet enough, you can go the wrong way down the hill and it works just fine. All right? And I often do it that way because on the inside of the bowl, you have to rub the bevel. So on the outside of the bowl, I often practice and just rub the bevel. I want to fix the rim here a little bit. Take this sharp edge off. <laughs> Next thing I'm going to do is go ahead and cut the little beads on the rim. Uh, not beads, shallow cones, I guess they were. I'm going to use this tool. You've seen me use this before. This is a scraper, it has an Alstert style cutter on the front here. And here I'm going to use this in a shear scraping mode, so I will never hold it flat across the rest like this. I'm going to rotate it up. All right, to about 45 degrees at least. And I might take it up further to 80. And when I get to the very end, I might bring it up even further, all right? And when I make my little cut, it's gonna be a little cut like this, a little motion like this, all right? Where both the back and the front of the gauge move, all right? It's not just the front and it's not just the back. It's both of them together. 
So I'll stick it in here and I'll make the first little one. There's one. And I'll make a second pass and make it a little deeper. I'll move over and make another one. First pass. Second pass. Move the line over a little bit. Oh, that's not good. So there's three nice little ones in there. Now I need something to delineate that. Here I have this one here that has a square point on it. All right. I should square. It's actually a 90 degree point or almost 90 degree. <coughs> I'm just going to cut my little detail here, a little place for the rim to stop. All right. So there's the place where the rim stops. Now I need to go down a little bit behind the rim, fix the bowl shape here. I wasn't too worried about it before. Make this perfect now. So my shape's not bad right now. I forgot what I was turning. Is this it? Yeah, that's good. I need to take a little bit more of this out of here. I have lots and lots of extra in there. I notice that a lot of people like to use every little bit of the bowl, of the blank. You know, I don't care about using every bit of the blank. What I care about is making a really nice, pleasing shape. You know, so that's how I always cut. And I usually just leave this extra in here and cut it out. I almost always turn to final shape on the bowls. I don't do that twice turn business. If they go a little bit out of round, I live with it. So, I'm always kind of careful about how my outside shape appears. We can see right now that the surface is pretty good, but I'm going to take and shear scrape this the same way I did cut those little things. I'm going to use the same tool. I'm going to flip it up on edge, and I'm going to scrape right around here. Now, the thing here is that I probably will not have this back, probably, I will not have this back on the point where I'm onto the bevel, right? I won't be using the bevel on here. I'll be pulling this around, and I'll adjust this angle to get the cut that I want, all right? I'll also adjust this angle to get the cut that I want. And the cut that I want is the one that gives me this little fine shaving like this, all right? So let's see that. So there's the shaving coming off. Here, as you can see that the shaving stopped. That's actually because I have the angle now too far. I need to pull the angle back this way a little bit more. Right? When I was coming around here, I had the angle, and then I didn't bring it around. I didn't bring the back of the pouch around fast enough. So we can just try it again. Bring the back of the gouge around faster this time. Up here at the top, I'm going to flip the cutter all the way up and go under that rim. I brought it all the way up to 90 degrees. See that it came all the way up to 90 degrees. The tendency might be to bring it down like this. If you bring it down like this, you're going to make a huge mess, right? You've got to bring it around and bring it up into this thing. And it takes quite a bit of practice, actually, to be able to bring it around and bring it up at the same time. But once you got it, you can scrape almost up to anything. And I don't like the shape, so I'm going to scrape a little bit more. Let's see what the surface looks like. <coughs> see the surface right here on the end grain looks awfully good and this is ash and ash is open grain it can be difficult to cut but sometimes nice and clean and my scraper here is getting a little bit dull so I have a simple solution I brought two of them so I didn't have to sharpen them <laughs> actually I brought three of them Looks like this one's not sharpened as well as the other one. So 
So here's what I'm getting is this tiny little shaving off of here. I'm not getting sawdust. If I had this in the conventional scraper mode, I get sawdust. Instead, I get these really nice little fine wispy sh shavings. All right. I'm not liking that one. Right now I am scraping a little bit for shape, which some people say, oh, you should never do that. You should go back to the hole gouge. And I agree with them. Until you get really good with the scraper, you probably shouldn't scrape for shape. But <coughs> after you get better with the shaper, it works pretty good. <clears throat> and I'm happy with the shape except for down at the very bottom. So I'm just going to make one little thing with the bowl gouge and we're going to move on. Because we want to go home tonight. And this will actually be a good people to look at afterwards, you can see the difference between the shape, between the finishes, between my where I scraped and where I just used the bowl gouge. Oh, here's the square one up here. I put a little bead down here. And that bead has two purposes. One is it balances with this bead up here. The other reason for this bead, and the real reason for it is, because when I turn this bowl around later, I'm going to finish the bottom, and I'm going to do all my finishing in the bottom below this bead, all right? So I'll turn this area down in here later, but I won't touch this area up in here. And this has a couple little bobbles in here. If I was really serious about this, I'd take these out before I would have stuck my little bead in there. <laughs> all right, so let's go around to the inside. Put the monroe to, to use. First thing I'm going to do is cut enough space in here so I got enough room to get the Monroe tool in. This is one of the things I always see from people is they always want to start out here and cut all the way in. And I haven't cut this surface yet and it may or may not be really round. So I always start in here. Cut a little bit out, move out, cut a little bit out, move out, cut a little bit out, move out, cut a little bit out. All right. I am not going to be using this, so I'm getting rid of this. If I hadn't been fooling around today, I would have had that in there the entire time I was cutting the outside of the bowl, because from a safety point of view, it'd be foolish not to have it in there when I could have. All right. Tool rest is too hot. So I'm not going to cut across the middle on center. I want to tell, cut right across the center. This is something that people can have trouble with too. If you have the tool rest right at the right spot, you should be able to glide right across the middle here. You should just cut it right out of there. All right. Which camera are you on right now? This one? Is that focused now? So when you have this right, you should be able to just let go up in here, right? You should just glide right across there because in here, this line in here is big enough so that I have something for the gouge to grab on, right? I'm not trying to cut a tiny little bit out of there. And in fact, I'm not cutting very much at all from my point of view. Usually that's about 3 sixteenths of an inch thick. Right now it's almost an eighth. So usually I make it a little bit deeper. You know, I usually be cutting about 3 sixteenths of an inch. But here it should just go right across. All right? This front hand is just holding this down on the rest, really. The back hand is doing all the work.
back hand is doing all the work back here. But the thing is, I'm not moving my arm around the back here. It's all my body. It's just body taking this out of here. Right? It's all body. Me rotating back from my right foot to my left foot. Take a real cut or two. People always ask me if I have a recording tool when I say no, I have too much fun cutting it out. How you doing? With, with your Allyman Road tool, work doing what you're doing now? I can't hear what you're saying. Can you use the Raleigh Road tool to do the... Yeah, I can use the Raleigh Road I'm going to do that in a second. All right. <laughs> So, like I said, with the Raleigh Monroe, it always works better around 50. I mean 500, I'm sorry, not 50. 500 RPM. And I need to move this further away so that I won't catch the tool. I want the, the shaft to be out here. I don't want the tool to be on the rest. I want the shaft to be there. All right? And I'm going to cut in reverse, and I warned you about that already. So I put the little screw in over there. I'm going to bring this in. Not going to be going forward. Going forward. Right now, I have a really aggressive, so I need to take some of that aggressive off of there. All right. Here I, I have it. Like I said before, I'm starting with a tool down like this, right? And I'm going to bring it up into the cut. All right. So I'm going to ride this top bevel on here. And I'm going to bring it up until it just barely starts to cut. And then I have control over If I want it to cut just a little bit, I leave it down. If I want it to cut more, I bring it up. All right? And if I try to rotate down into the thing, it'll cut all of a sudden. And I'm going to do that right now for you. All right? I'm going to rotate down into it. So here I'm riding on the bottom of the battle. This is not the way to do it. And when I bring it in, you see what happens? Bang, it takes off. And I really can't control it. All right? <coughs> if I bring it the other way, bring it down in, I can control it. I can bring it up. Remember, I still have the cutter set very aggressively right now. It's about open about two millimeters, and I really should have it around one millimeter, all right? But just to speed things up a little bit for the demo, I have it up at two millimeters. I'm going to close it down in a minute, but I'm going to take some more of this out of here, all right? So before I go too far, I need to make the rim on my bowl, because I've almost gone too far already. So, <clears throat> four. this go downhill and actually I may have made it gone downhill too much because now it's going to be really hard to come up underneath that far. I'm going to make the little marks on here, the same ones I made on the outside. I'll do exactly the same motion. a little of this sharp edge off of here because it's dangerous if I run into it. And normally I just round that over a little bit with a little bit of sandpaper at the very end. So we can see what that looks like. It has my three little marks on there. It's nice and clean. All right, so now I have a rim to go underneath of. So the first thing I'm going to do is cut the rim. I could cut this with the Raleigh Monroe, but I usually find it's better off to just cut this rim in with the scrape, with a with point tool. So that'll be the rim on the inside. So now we can go back and finish it up. 
on the inside. All right. I'm going to turn my laser on now so you guys can see where I am. spot. In order to get the laser to line up, I need to make sure the laser line is going straight down here so that I have the line. Excuse me. When I have the line on the outside, I'll be able to see where it is. One of the things I don't like about any of these round cutters, it doesn't make any difference what laser you use, is where do you point the little laser line? I don't know if you can notice it right now. You probably can't get it on the camera. Nope. Is where do I point it at? Do I point it here? Or do I point it over here? Or do I point it over there, you know? So I just kind of point this right in the middle kind of there and hope that it's going to be in the right spot. And I got to remember that it'll cut a little bit deeper than I have it set for. I'm actually going to move it back a little bit. But the idea is now that the laser points directly at the tip, I'll know where it is by looking on the outside, all right? So if I was inside of a hollow form right now, I shoved it inside where I couldn't see it at all, I'd be able to see right where I am, all right? So here you can see it's right here, and I take this line, and I subtract it from the very outside edge over here, and I say, oh, that's about an inch and a half thick, all right? So that's how I figure out how I am on inside of a hollow form piece. So the only thing we really needed for tonight is I can see directly in here, so I don't need the laser. But that's a really another important point, is when you're learning to use this tool, don't pick a really hard shape with a little hole, because you won't be able to see where you are, you won't be able to stick your finger in there to feel it. You know, learn to use it on something like this where I'm just cutting the rim under here. All right? Uh, let's give this a try. Cut it out. You guys come to my house and remind me of this too. <laughs> vertical. I have to say though that I don't get too, theoretically it has to be perfect. In reality it doesn't have to be perfect because like I just said to you a little while ago, I'm approximating anyway because I can't point at exactly the little round part anyway, right? So it's all an approximation. <laughs> and for me, what I do is, when I'm doing a real hollow form, when I first put it in at the very beginning, I watch very carefully how thick it looks appears to be, all right? How thick the wall thickness appears to be by between the distance between the laser and the outside wall. And that first little section where I can put my finger in there and feel it, you know? So once I put my finger in there and feel it, then I say, oh, you know, the laser is reading a half inch, but it's really a quarter inch, you know? So I just subtract a quarter inch in my mind all the way around. Understand what I'm saying? So I use that first section where I can stick my finger in to calibrate the laser, basically, is where the laser is pointing. So then, whether if the laser is really, you know, off off kilter, 
it doesn't make that much difference. But really, the laser should be pointing directly down. Right? But the other thing is, I told you, I always, I always put it over this way when I'm starting, right? And then I pull it back up again. So that's another fact that when you push it over this way, it looks like it's a lot thicker. When you pull it back up, it'll get thin. I also think I have this over 500 RPM or something. I closed it down a little bit. And I opened it on the wrong side. So you're getting a good example of once you get this cover set to the right place, don't mess with it. This carbide cutter is getting a bit dull. I'm going to have to get a new one. why I have the cutter set the way I do. I have this V in here. I like that V in there. I almost always keep that V in there. It allows me to get the thing right cutting at a 90 degree angle to the wood. You're also shining light through the wood now. Yep. That's what I was just stopping to see. Yep. So I'm about 3 sixteenths of an inch, which is right about my final thickness. So. It's good. It's actually a little bit thinner than I would have liked for the demo. <laughs> oh, that's the way the world goes. So, since we can shine the wood through there, I'm not going to take my chances and send it across the room. But normally what I would do is come in here, work a little bit more, and work back up under the rim, right? But you can see that if by coming back around in here, and I can move my tool rest around a little bit too, and get better support, I can go right up underneath of this rim, all right? So now all I gotta do is finish out the rest of the bowl in here. And normally what I do is I take my bowl gouge and cut some of this out. So that's what we're gonna do. This is a slightly different bowl gouge. This is a standard Ellsworth gouge, this is about 60 degrees. This one I sharpen by sticking it two inches out of, the, out of the jig when I sharpen it. This one I put only one and three eighths inch out of the jig when I sharpen it, so this brings the angle up in here steeper. So this one will allow me to reach further back up in here. So this is normally what you use for a bottoming gouge, but since I want to reach back up underneath of this rim and bring it around, I'm going to be using this gouge. Forward. So we'll cut the rest of this out. like where that tool rest was because the center is right there and the tool rest ended right at the center which would leave you absolutely no safety zone whatsoever which is a big sin you always want to make sure that when you go across the center there's room for you to go across beyond the center because sometimes the gouge does that on its own See, 
see how deep we are. Got this gizmo from an old time turner. Has this little thing here, it swings back and forth, right? And this tells me where I am here. And this is 3 eighths of an inch thick, which is exactly the thickness I like on the bottom of my bowls. So I put this inside of here, right? And now I swing it over there, it's going to tell me where I am, right? So this is the inside of the bowl, bottom. Let's switch out the other camera. The other camera. There we go. So this is the inside bottom, and this is the outside bottom, right? Because I know I always like my bowls to be 3 eighths of an inch. And this goes right past here, and it always sits right there, lines up with that. All right? So I can see that I got another quarter of an inch, maybe. I'm looking at the difference between here and this here, which is my outside bottom. It's about a quarter of an inch. So I want to go another quarter of an inch deep. <coughs> Right now, is I'm going to blend this in out here with where I had it before. And what I'm actually doing is I'm watching what's going on right here. Because I can't actually see what I'm cutting over here. I'm watching right here when I come in with the gouge. So I come in here with the gouge and I'm watching right there. See exactly how much I'm picking up. And I'm going to bring it around. So I'm going to blend this area right in here these two. So right now what I have is right here where this is here, it's almost down to the right thickness, but a little bit in. It's kind of thick, so I'll pick up in there. Another skill that you can practice a lot on that's really important is being able to reach in here and pick this up without making a huge mark where you start the gouge. All right? And the way you do that is by riding on the back bevel in here. All right? So you can ride the back bevel here. Right? You can feel it just move across there, and then you stroke it once or twice, right? You say, oh, it's not going to cut this time, so you move the back of the gouge over here. This, this end of the gouge goes that way, right? So as you move the gouge out, and then you strike it again, so, oh, it's not going to cut. It's not going to cut, right? Then you bring it out another time, a little bit more, and you'll see it cut. <coughs> so when you see it cut, then you can go across there, all right? So that's what I'm doing each time in here when I start the gouge. I reach in here. Oh, it's not starting. It's not cutting. I'll bring the back around a little bit more. There, there it is, it almost stuck. So there it is, I bring it up. Now I go through it. Here you go slow. People have a tendency to try to fall down the hill too fast and keep up with the lead. Here, if you learn to go slow, you're, up, you're better. Here, I'll just go slowly right across the middle. And in this section in here, I hunt for the up-down point, all right? Because I want to find the spot, spot at which I'll be able to glide right across the middle, right on, all right? So that's why you saw me take a couple little tries on it. And right now, if you look at it, it's almost gone. There's no mark there hardly at all. So even though you guys can see through over here, it's not really a big problem because this is a wet log. So that is still roughly 3 sixteenths of an inch in there. All right? You can see through there because it's wet. You always have to remember that when you're thinking about the bowl. When you see through it, if it's a wet log, it's not a huge problem. All right, so one last thing I normally do
is I would finish this section up in here and blend this back in in here. When I do this, I would get my cowling tool and do it. Because I can't reach the bowl gouge up underneath the rim anymore. I'm take, and I'm going to close this up even more than I had it closed before. I don't want it to cut very much, and I actually want to burnish it a little bit. When this gets closed enough, when I ride it along there on the, on the bevel, it'll actually burnish it a little bit. And that burnish can become very similar to the burnish that you get from the gouge back riding the bevel on the gouge. So I got it, so it's almost closed. Because right now, in here, where I was riding the gouge, it's very smooth. And up in here, where I was cutting before, it's kind of rough. All right, put it in reverse. Slow it down. Make sure I have a trailing, bring it up into the cup. You hear that sound, it actually sounds like I'm riding it on there, and I am. But I just cut that one little zone between where the gouge picked up and where the, where the cutter left off before. All right? And the only thing left now would be to decide whether or not you want this nice smooth surface in here or whether you want to put a little ridges in there or not. But, I think that's enough for tonight, unless people want to see any questions. <laughs> you prefer this tool, Coral, to the various alternative hollow tools? What I, what I really like about this tool is you notice I always had it here in the same <coughs> place where I pretty much keep my bowl gouge, right? Because I can move my body around, so I really like that part about it. I like the fact that when you're working with it, you get a pretty smooth finish on the inside. Whereas with the Ellsworth style tools with the little tips on the front, they can be rather difficult to get in there. The other thing I really like about this tool, let me see if I have it on the camera here. This distance in here, this distance in here is not that long. There's a Robert Sorby one, I forget what he calls it, the Sovereign or something. It has a nice little head on here, and then you can rotate the little thing on the head and it moves this in and out, which is really nice. But this head is just too long, you know? And I have too much trouble getting it into places and getting it into the right cutting angle. You know? So this is really well designed and also the shape of this in here, Raleigh has, has refined over time and this shape works really, really well. Just the shape of the top cutter in here. And also the shape in here that allows these the, the, the shavings to come out works really well. You know? This is the ES2 of this type. Yeah. This he has a two, and he has a he has the original one, which is sometimes now called the mini one, which is in my handout. So what is that one? This is the Holliver two. Oh. Okay. The difference between these two is that on the mini one or the the original Holliver, this link here is curved, and it's curved the other way. So you notice right away that I don't like it at all because I can't run the lathe in reverse, yeah. right? But if you look around on the web, you'll find that a lot of people say, "Oh, I don't like that curved one." And there's some people that aren't even quite that polite about it. They're like, that thing's dead wrong. <laughs> it just doesn't work, you know? The curve was a great idea, but it doesn't work. <laughs> does and he's not selling it anymore, so. Yeah. Does the carbide cutter fit the original one? Yeah, he has a carbide cutter that will fit the original one. You have to buy the one. He has two different carbide cutters. I think the smaller cutter is way nicer than the original one. I've carried them both. And the smaller one? You mean this one? Well, the very original one is the one I have. Oh, you have the very original one, yeah. I've never seen that one yet. Uh, it's got a larger cutter, the smaller cutter, which I think what I would call it is smaller, about three inch. Yeah. That is really the nicest one in the market. So you like this one, then? Yeah, I agree with you about that. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen, I've had, I had another tool that has a larger cutter on the front there. 
in my opinion, is like, you know, David Ellsworth decided like a 3 16 cutter was the right size cutter. And then you saw all these guys go up to these bigger cutters, but I think that was because they couldn't manufacture or buy a smaller cutter, you know. When they went out to get them, they were all half inch cutters or 5 eighths inch cutters. But now I've seen that everybody's going right back down again to the smaller cutters, and the smaller ones work better, you know. The same thing I find in the Ellsworth style tools, the smaller one works better. He has a quarter inch wide and a 3 16 and I put the quarter inch on the shelf and I don't use it. I only use the 3 16 one because the smaller cutter cuts less buff, but it cuts faster, so in the end you're done faster. So. Trent Bosch says that the quarter, of, the quarter of an inch is the perfect size. 3 16 is a little too aggressive. Are we talking about the round cutters or the, or the? No, no, the, 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 you know, the one that uses the, 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 the Ellsworth type of thing. He uses the Ellsworth style one, yeah. yeah. That's what I'm saying. That's what he says. He says Whether it's aggressive or not in 3 16 depends on how round it is versus how pointed it is when you cut, when you sharpen it. I can do either one. I, I think that's, that's the point, you know, that there is a personal presence. Because I, I use, for example, the, the, the metronotum yeah. three end things. And I think they're absolutely great. You can see what I can do without any, just three end. The only problem with those ones is that you don't, you can, I don't have a finishing one like this where you, know, you can finish the little grooves that are left. But that one, is one that is, uh, you have a quarter of an inch. One is about less than a quarter. Yeah. And uh, the two others are about uh, more than a quarter. And I, I don't see too much. It's how much you push it, how much you, you work. So Raleigh, Raleigh also has a shear scraper that fits on the end of here. I really like it, but I almost never use it. Because I can get a smooth enough sh for me with this, you know. But if you can, you put the shear scraper in there and it, it comes around and makes a very nice angle. I know people that swear by that shear scraper, but I don't use it very often. I didn't bring it with me. Yeah, the problem with these random things is you cannot go into, uh, you know, into fine points. Let's say you have that shoulder there, and I'm sure it's round. Mm -hmm. It's round in there, but it has its good in band points. If you can't go into a little spot, you can't cut through the edge quite as fast. Well, I know. <laughs> 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 you, you, you can do a nice, perfect. I, what I sometimes do is use this one to do most of the work, and then I get my little Ellsworth and go in there and do the little last section up underneath the bowl, and I get that really nice little thing in there. Okay, thank you, Paul.